we do not have the problem they say that we have. It isn't happening. Climate change is one of those things that divides people. You'll either believe the science or you'll think it's part of some global liberal conspiracy to promote a one world socialist agenda. In this video, we'll present to you the great climate change conspiracy and detail how it works throughout our society. And here's the conspiracy. There is no doubt that climate change is happening, but corporations, wealthy business leaders, philanthropists, conservative politicians, some parts of the media and contrarian scientists will lead you to believe that some doubt does exist. The deniers spin a spider's web to reinforce their economic, political and even religious wants. These are all inextricably linked and you'll see names cropping up again and again. But let's try and go through them one by one. Everything begins with corporations. Big business, energy companies, shale, gas, oil and coal conglomerates fund climate change denial. This is done in many different ways, but let's look at a few of them. In 1989, the Global Climate Coalition was set up. Its members included British Petroleum, Shell, Ford, General Motors, Texaco and many more representatives of industries with their profits tied to fossil fuels. It was formed to oppose immediate action being taken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions following the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They did this by aggressively lobbying politicians and launching a ferocious public relations campaign to rubbish climate change science and scientists. In 1997, when the Kyoto Protocol was adopted, some of the GCC's members, including BP, left the coalition and it looked as if some of the corporate world was ready to accept the principle of climate change. But the GCC soldiered on until 2002 when it disbanded, saying its mission had been accomplished by contributing to a new national approach to global warming, which included rejecting the mandatory cuts in emissions required by the Kyoto Protocol. They also know that this guy who was in power at the time shared their views. In 2009, a document filed in a US federal lawsuit showed that the GCC had waged this campaign against climate science, despite their own scientific experts warning that the science could not be refuted. But why would big businesses ignore sound advice from their own institutions to pursue the opposite agenda, I hear you ask? Well. Noam Chomsky argues that the same CEOs and managers who are trying to convince people that climate change is a liberal hoax are well aware of the dangers but have been institutionalised. That is, they work solely to maximise profit. Because if they don't, they'll be regarded as a failure and they'll be moved on and somebody else will be brought in to replace them. That's the way the world works. So even if they know what they're doing is dangerous, they feel they have no choice but to do it. But the end of the GCC didn't mean the end of corporate campaigning. Other groups have included the Information Council on the Environment, the Greening Earth Society, the Cooler Heads Coalition, the Marshall Institute and the Competitive Heads Institute, all of which have received corporate funding from oil, gas and electricity giants. Then there's the US Chamber of Commerce, which very openly opposed any legal measures proposed to tackle climate change. They also sat in the driving seat in challenging the Environmental Protection Agency's Clean Air Act, which sought to regulate greenhouse gases. They've waged campaigns to rubbish climate change stories and sowed the seeds of fear about how acting on climate change might have disastrous consequences for the economy. Actually, a lot of experts predict that it would end up making more money for the economy, just not for fossil fuel and fossil fuel reliant industries. In 2009, in what was perhaps a sign of attitudes changing in some parts of the business community, the US Chamber of Commerce faced a walkout from some very high profile members because of their open criticism of cap and trade policies being implemented. The immediate reaction was to soften the tone of the criticism, but the message remained. 
In 2012, the US Chamber of Commerce spent over $100 million on lobbying. It is by far the biggest lobbying group in Washington. And that brings us on to the next element in the climate conspiracy, politics, or more specifically, money in politics. In 2010, the US Chamber of Commerce spent $32 million on candidates for the midterm elections. And according to chamber.35.org, 94% of that went to climate change deniers. These politicians are already highly skeptical about climate change because accepting the scientific fact would question their absolute faith in the infinite progression of the free market economy. But who are the individual politicians? Well, let's start with this guy. For a long time, Senator James Inhofe has been one of the loudest voices in Congress against climate change. In fact, he called it the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. As the head of the Committee on Environment and Public Works, he consistently invited climate change deniers to come and speak in front of the committee. Working alongside him was Mark Morano, who filled the committee's website with climate change denial content. And there'll be more on him later. The largest contributors to Inhofe's campaign since his career in the capital began in 1987 have been the oil and gas industries, with a total of nearly $1.6 million. His biggest single contributors? Well, coming in at three, you've got Devon Energy, who are oil and gas. In second place, you've got Murray Energy, the largest privately owned coal company in America. But at number one, you've got Coke Industries. You may not know who they are. They're into oil, they're into gas, and they're into timber and chemicals and minerals and so on. David and Charles Koch also funded a number of anti-environmental and anti-tax campaigns. They've set up a number of conservative think tanks and seemingly grassroots movements. Those include places like the Cato Institute and Citizens for a Sound Economy, which later became Americans for Prosperity. Now, Americans for Prosperity vociferously campaign against taxes, healthcare reform, and all sorts of other socialist ideas. They've also been one of the major contributors to the Tea Party movement. Now, major figures there include Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman, both of whom are ardent climate change deniers. Thank you, America. Together we'll do this. In her article exposing the link between the Tea Party and Coke Industries in The New Yorker, Jane Meyer referred to the Koch brothers' political involvement as so secretive it was covert. The lengths investors in climate change denial go to were exposed by a Guardian investigation in 2013. That investigation looked into two trusts, the Donors Trust and the Donors Capital Fund. They allowed wealthy donors to funnel money anonymously to climate change denial think tanks and activists. The Donors Trust chief executive, Whitney Ball, said that the organization existed to help donors promote liberty, which we understand to be limited government, personal responsibility and free enterprise. The system means that there is no transparency, no accountability and almost no way to follow the money, which presents massive problems that we'll get into later. It's estimated that the Koch brothers and another climate change denying funder, Richard Mellon Scaife, may have contributed more money to climate change denial than even ExxonMobil, who are the biggest corporate sponsor. George Monbiot has described it as a kind of political coup, with a handful of billionaires shoving a spanner into the legislative process. Now another one of those billionaires is Rupert Murdoch, who owns a vast array of press and media around the world. Murdoch has had a complicated relationship with climate change. A few years ago, he recognized it as a great threat to the planet. These days, he's often found baiting greenies on his Twitter feed, saying that they are crippling US growth and so on. Even though News Corp has a commitment to becoming a carbon neutral company, the Murdoch owned media generally takes an anti-climate change stance. Fox News has trumpeted the Tea Party cause like there's no tomorrow, even putting Sarah Palin on the payroll. The Wall Street Journal and his Australian papers are also outspoken critics. And that brings us nicely onto the third part of the pie, the media.
Some elements of the conservative media take, as we said, an openly sceptical view of climate change. But there are more subtle ways that the climate change conspiracy exploits the media. And this is how. The trouble with these billionaires funding conservative think tanks and front organisations is that these organisations are able to publish contrarian studies. Those are then picked up by various media groups who treat the studies as legitimate and credible because they are unaware of who is really funding them. Which goes back to the problems of secrecy that we mentioned earlier. They're presented as an alternative academia and as of equal worth because of a common problem with the media. The notion of objectivity in the media, in reality, often means presenting a simple dichotomy. Here's one side, here's the other. Those are your two options. But usually, there are many more options available. On climate change, that means that you have the consensus view, the view of the vast majority of scientists, which is that climate change is happening. And that vast majority is about 97%, by the way. And most of those agree with the rate predicted by the science but they aren't quite unanimous. You have the minority view, which includes some much respected scientists, that there are too many unknown factors to be certain about climate change. Now this creates only three possibilities. Either it is happening, it isn't happening, or it is happening, but it's not as bad as predicted. But there is another option, which very rarely, if ever, gets thrown into the debate. A study was published by MIT in 2009 using what was described at the time as the most comprehensive modelling yet carried out. That study found that the problem of climate change would actually be twice as severe as previously estimated and that it could be even worse than that. Now what might people think if they were given that side of the argument and not presented with such a simplistic view all of the time? The mainstream media through some radio and TV stations, as well as conservative-leaning newspapers, has created an echo chamber for climate change denial stories. More recently, blogs and social media outlets have proved just as valuable to the denial machine. One of the most powerful of those denial bloggers is Mark Morano, who we met earlier working for Senator Jim Inhofe. He's previously worked for Rush Limbaugh, who uses his own radio show to denounce environmental wackos and the right-wing cybercast news service. And Murano's work has been supported by Richard Mellon Scaife. Now, the greatest media success of the climate change denial machine was ClimateGate. There were around 1,000 emails leaked from the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia. A selection of those emails were picked out by the denialists, misquoted, twisted out of their original meaning and used as proof that climate science is a sham. Those claims were repeated in parts of the mainstream media seemingly without reading the original sources, contributing to the hysteria around them. All the usual suspects like Sarah Palin and Senator Jim Inhofe threw their weight behind them and so the story grew. The claims made by Palin, Inhofe and others have been shown to be baseless by three UK-based investigations into the climate gate scientists. All three of those investigations have found that the methods used and the results found in the studies by the climate gate scientists were legitimate. Those investigations did, however, raise questions about access to data and suggested that there should be greater openness from the UAE scientists in the future. ClimateGate showed the strategy of the denial movement, trying to rubbish climate scientists by questioning their processes, their results, and ultimately their credibility. But here's the thing, most of the major figures in the climate denial world have no scientific background. Those that do are few and far between, and there are many questions over how they're funded. Professor Patrick Michaels from the Cato Institute, which is funded by the Koch brothers, has been an extremely vocal denier. He's also one of the few who has genuine scientific credentials. A leaked memo from the Intermountain Rural Electric Association in 2006 showed that that organisation had paid him $100,000 for his services to climate change denial. The memo also revealed that Michaels had received contributions from other electric cooperatives and other sources, including the Koch brothers. In 2010, he also admitted that up to 40% of his work 
was funded by the petroleum industry, despite having told Congress it was only 3%. Professor Michaels and his supporters say that the funding has no influence over his work, it merely helps him to operate. But there are many people who would question that. Riley Dunlap and Aaron McCright argue that the close links between deniers, conservative think tanks and their funders has created an industry of denial, which can provide huge rewards and an air of legitimacy for poor, non-peer-reviewed work. But as we said, you don't have to have a background in science to be a denier. Lord Christopher Monckton, for example, has become one of the leading figures in the climate change denial world. His background is in the classics, but that didn't stop him questioning the legitimacy of the UN science with some pseudoscience of his own, which was immediately dismissed by, you know, actual scientists. And now we're getting to the final piece in the puzzle. In 2010, Republican Congressman John Shimkus was gunning for the leadership of the Energy and Commerce Committee. He is an evangelical Christian who previously quoted a passage from the Old Testament in a congressional hearing over proposed cap and trade laws. So I want to start with um, Genesis 8, um, verse 21 and uh, 22. Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. This, Shimkus said, meant that climate change could not be a threat to the planet, because his God had said so in a book that was written thousands of years ago. The earth will end only when God declares it's time to be over. Now, nobody would question his right to believe what he wants, but I think it's only right that we question the use of a religious text to raise concerns about science. So that is the conspiracy. Climate change denial is an attempt by global corporations, conservative politicians, and the rich and powerful to defend industrial capitalism and maintain profit margins. They're not doing anything that is legally wrong and are perhaps merely doing what is their duty in an industrial capitalist society to provide growth and keep their shareholders happy. There is a great climate change conspiracy, a well-oiled machine that has cogs turning efficiently in every sector. And those companies and individuals, those who are really in control, they've done everything in their power to pull the wool over your eyes. Yeah.